I haven't got no PowerPoint, so, uh, and I'm not an academic, so uh, a bit of rough and ready Mancunian, Afro Caribbean presentation. I apologise for Zita and Donna, they're on a ferry carrying much needed food, uh, medical supplies, and so on to the people of Calais, which we do through Black Activists Rising Against the Cuts once a month. <laughs> And so as the co-chair of Barrack, I've been asked to stand in uh, today. Uh, Barrack was formed in July 2010, just after the May ele uh, Tory elections. And we formed Barrack because we wanted to do two things. We wanted to bring the black trade unionist movement together with the black community activist movement. There was a disjuncture, uh, a, a false divide that uh, was weakening our response to racism. And so we anticipated uh, very early on uh, in July in 2010 that the cuts when they would come would fall massively disproportionately on the very most poorest and vulnerable in society and so black activists rising against the cuts was formed to point out that disproportionality and also with the prediction that economic austerity would increase racism uh, and we were right on all of those counts and we stand vindicated uh, today on that our view was to make sure that the anti-austerity movement was principally prioritising anti-racism and black representation because we knew that the scapegoats for the austerity clash would be the working class and in, in that the most popular and regular scapegoats of Muslims, asylum seekers, refugees, black people uh, 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 and, and others. And so Barrett was formed and then to bring these issues uh, forward. And also, we represent black workers who are being bullied in the workplace because of racism. And let me tell you, this is a, a, an epidemic uh, of bullying in relation to black workers. I make people whose, and I think you were mentioning it earlier on, I make people whose lives have been psychologically destroyed because of the intimidation and almost psychological black ops operations conducted by management to undermine and target at black workers. And we've had example after example of uh, Barrack intervening uh, to try and fight uh, uh, against the racism of employers. And it comes in many forms. I was laughing at uh, 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 Phil's uh, presentation from Scotland because he was talking about uh, performance management and restructuring. Well, these are words that any black worker listens to, runs for the hills, screaming at <laughs> the mention of, because we know exactly what that means. You know, restructuring means getting rid of the people you don't want and keeping the people you do. And they're invariably uh, white males and so on and so forth. So we understand the managerial theoretical application of discrimination in a non-discriminatory form uh, that appears to be neutral, but in effect uh, gives us the same old, same old inequality and disproportionality that we've seen before. And why is that? When we've got reams of policies against equality, bullying, and, 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 and you know, complex uh, consultative reports produced at you know, great cost about how we're going to have the most perfect equality and diversity and equal opportunities or pro diversity uh, uh, system. Now, you, in order to de gut the politics of anti racism, we've had to reduce, or what the, the right have tried to do, is to reduce racism in the workplace to a managerial uh, uh, issue. As if, if we just get these processes right, if we just get these policies right, it's all fine. It's not all fine, because you and I know as workers that a working culture of a company or an organization eats policy for breakfast. Yeah. So anything that you write down, if the workers say, oh, fuck that for a game of soldiers, I ain't having that, it's not gonna be implemented. And you don't care how much policy you put, you put around it, it's not gonna be implemented. Because it's the culture of racism, the culture of prejudice and discrimination that is so deeply embedded in the neoliberal British culture, contemporary culture of Britain today, that it, it's, it acts as a bulwark. It defeats any attempt to put formal policy around it. That's why you can have 10,000 policies on reducing stop and search, and stop and search goes up every year. 
uh, it gives you an example of the strength of the working culture within the police service that even despite uh, the most, you know, even despite the Home Secretary coming out and saying black boys are being disproportionately stopped and searched, the increase in stop and search doesn't even dip. It continues at a continued rate of rising and so on and so forth. And of course, they'll tell you that stop and search is falling because of the Home Secretary's intervention. Let me tell you, they've just stopped recording uh, stop and searches to black boys because their latest technique, which is a bit of bullying on the streets, is I'm stopping and searching you. Uh, can I have my ticket so I can prove I've been stopped and searched? Well, it's going to take at least half an hour, son, so if you're prepared to wait, I'll give you one. All right, I don't want that. I'm on my way. I've gone. That means that I think there is massive disproportionate underreporting in that scale. And we see that the impacts of bullying in the workplace right, uh, re resulted in the snowy peaks of white management in institutions right across the piece. How long has the public sector had equal opportunities policies in order to de deliver a diverse workforce? I know, I've campaigned on that. You know, we were started in the early 80s, uh, and we're, where are we now? 30, nearly 40 years later? Do those major institutions look any way dissimilar to you than they were a few years ago? Yeah, you've got a few token women here, a few token blacks here on the telly every now and again, giving a feeling of inclusivity and diversity. But meanwhile, in the black community, we've got 55% youth unemployment. That's higher than the unemployment rate of Palestine youth in West Bank, Gaza currently, which is at 45%. It's higher than the unemployment rate in Spain. It's higher than the youth unemployment rate in Greece. And I don't even believe the 55% figure is real because all of the sanctioned little black boys and black girls and Muslim kids who got thrown off the dole because they turned up five minutes late for, uh, for their uh, 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 appointments, web-based appointments or whatever, signing on, uh, also are not in the figures. So you've got a huge crisis around bullying and imitation for black workers and it's increasingly difficult to prosecute your case. I don't know about you, I'm a fairly reasonable guy, I'm not super intelligent, but you know, I can read. Uh, when it comes to actually trying to prove a case of racism in an employment tribunal, you need to be a NASA scientist yeah. with a couple of PhDs. <laughs> a couple of PhDs in, in, in cross bollocks relativity in order to be able to argue your case in there. And I've seen and I've been up with thousands of black workers who have won the moral argument, they've won the objective argument, they've lost it on a technicality because the paperwork wasn't right when you get to the employment tribunal. And now that we've had these employment tribunal fees put on us, we've seen an 85% reduction in race equality, uh, race employment tribunal cases being taken. That whole employment tribunal thing for women, for people with disabilities, for lesbian and gays and black people, if there's one fundamental thing we need to get Jeremy to focus on, is that we need total reform of the employment tribunal justice system. Because it's not bringing uh, justice for us. But I think there are also other challenges. And you know, I'm going to be a controversial speaker chair, so it's going to bring some controversy to the element. But the trade union movement needs to get its act together and try to get the black people. How, how many people, workers, do Barack have? We're not funded by a march. Uh, get a little funding from, you know, shop stewards and trade union. If you can help fund us for the Cali or for our work on black representation, please uh, feel free to do so. But we don't get major funding. And yet the black uh, workers we have coming through our door who said our trade union won't represent us. These are trade unionists that have been in the movement for years. And what they're saying is that white trade unionists are coming to represent them understand less about racism than, uh, than they do and therefore they're making fundamental errors of judgment about whether a, set, a case is likely to be successful. Even when it comes to, okay, when the more subtle aspects of racism and management come along, white trade unionists are not coming to terms with the reality of white privilege so they don't understand the racism and they don't only agree with black workers Many women will have faced this in the movement years ago when they were first pursuing sex complaints. When uh, male trade unionists were saying, I don't agree with sexism. We have that every day with racism. I don't, we're not quite sure it's racism. Are you sure it's racism? So now we've got a trade unionist questioning whether a black worker's sanity, whether they've actually conceived and experienced the problem in the way that they have seen it. 
And we've called on the trade union move to improve their training of trade union representatives in order that we can get better quality representation. Because I tell you what, Black uh, uh, Barrett did a, a survey and we found out of 3,000 people that we surveyed under 25 who were black workers in trade unions, 75% of them said they'd switch and join a black trade union tomorrow because they're not being represented and they're not confident about being represented by trade unionists who seem to have particular, you know, that, that what their view is, and this is the black community's view, if, you're, if it's a white woman and it's sexism, they know all about it, the case is done, they're experienced, if it's paying conditions, they know all about it, they go in there, if it's racism, it's a sharp intake of breath. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And I don't believe that's a lack of commitment, I believe that's a lack of understanding. <laughs> but on some levels, there is uh, not only a lack of understanding, there are people in the trade union movement who themselves are colluding openly with racism. Yeah. And I can tell you this, I've represented black workers who are working for a labour authority which have struggled to get trade unions to represent because they don't want to put a massive race case against the labour authority. Yeah. Yeah. And therefore they're doing everything in their power to frustrate and dampen down uh, race uh, 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 equality, employment, uh, uh, grievances and disciplinaries. And when you look at the fear and the experience of the black worker, we are more likely to be disciplined. We are more likely to launch a grievance. We are less likely to survey that grievance. Got to wind up now, five minutes. Less likely to survey that grievance. So we've got fundamental problems uh, within uh, our movement, uh, and we need to get that together. And let me tell you why. Because Brexit, the economic crash of 2008, took a, an already a community, Muslim, African, Asian, Caribbean, already suffering high levels of social inequality and deprivation prior to the crash, 2008 amplified that. And now post-Brexit, we've had a further amplification of racism. So race hate is now through the roof. We're in Greenwich. I hate coming to this place, because every time I walk up here, and I see the Stephen Lawrence building uh, uh, at the beginning there, and then I look at the glorious colonial palisade built off the backs of my people, I ain't particularly happy that we still haven't got reparations. That's a separate issue, but it struck me emotionally. I thought I'd share it with you. <laughs> No, criticism of the venue, no, criticism of the, of, the, of the money that was used to build it and how we got here. But, uh, so we know that racism is increasing. We see across Europe that the fundamental political fact that we have to get to grips with, that where, wherever there is economic decline, there's an increase in racism. And it will mature into democratically elected fascism, as sure as Le Pen is Le Pen in France and the rest of the European right wing are getting elected uh, 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 across Europe. And it's this fundamental, and I've seen, winding up now, Chair, I've seen austerity uh, uh, panels uh, talking about people's austerity and we're fighting against not a single black person on the panel. And it's not considered to be controversial. Now, if you had an all male panel, it would be controversial. Yeah? yeah. Uh, but you can have a panel in which we understand that racism is one of the major products of Brexit and the 2008 crash. And then the movement is struggling to do anything but offer us tokenistic representation in our struggle against it. You are dividing our own working class. People say to me, Blue, focus on black self-organisation. It's a division of the working class in the struggle against racism. I say you are strengthened by our self-organisation, but only if it comes as a sort of equality of uh, an alliance, a political alliance, in which you begin to understand and accept that the white trade union movement and the shop stewards need much more in-depth understanding of the dynamic of white prejudice, the reality of racism as it impacts upon black workers. The black training and enterprise, uh, the business in the community, the Tory shit all from the charity, but it's produced a, a, a report, 24,000 black and ethnic minority workers, produced a report, 30% of them said they'd experienced racism in the last five years. Another 30% of them uh, said they'd uh, uh, witness it. Now that's a Tory-led think tank. I'm telling you, if the trade union movement was to do a survey, a proper survey, in-depth racism, it would be shocked at what its old members were telling us. And in summary, it's not just about poor representation. Because I've got black workers who are employed by trade unionists who have been discriminated against by the bloody trade union. So the National Association of Probation Officers is one in that. They attacked their Assistant General Secretary, who's a black woman, and conspired 
to suggest that she was having an illicit relationship with the then General Secretary when it came to the Employment Tribunal. It was proved that not only was the General Secretary guilty of sexual and racial harassment and lost his job, Jonathan Porter, the old ge uh, Assistant General Secretary, but what led up to that point was a collusion between that whole executive to dampen down and contain the racism element of that particular complaint. And the reason why you don't know about it is because it's racism on the left and nobody wants to speak about it. We've got to break this taboo. Black workers are in desperate need. We're being pushed to the edge of the economic precipice. It will erupt in civil disturbance and disruption. I'm going to tell you that now. You're going to have to get used to Black Lives Matter civil disobedience because we are simply not prepared to continue with the old way of doing things in the status quo. And we put this appeal out to you so you can join us in the fight against racism so that we don't have to put Black Lives Matter actions on trade unions because they're becoming part of the problem, not part of the solution. Thank you very much.